Hello and welcome to our lecture on, uh, on Acadia, Acadie uh, in French, uh, the, the other French colony, the smaller French colony. So I mentioned this last week, the, the, the major French colony is Canada, uh, modern day Quebec, but the smaller one is Acadia and it's largely the Mar Canadian Maritimes, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island. It certainly at the time spilled over into what we would now call New England. Uh, much of northern Maine would have been considered part of Acadia, parts of Vermont. Uh, so certainly it, it, it's, a, it's a bigger territory than currently we would call uh, the Maritimes. Um, but uh, heavily focused on the Bay of Fundy, that, that large bay between, um, between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, which, um, this is important for later, uh, is the home of the world's highest tides, massive tides. Uh, and that'll be an important detail uh, uh, in the story that we're going to be telling uh, today. The story of the expulsion is the story of Acadian history. It is the defining moment in Acadian history, which is a tragic thing because there's so many positive things that could be looked at in Acadian history, uh, but this is the moment that changes everything. In 1755, with the Seven Years' War apparently looming, they don't know it's the Seven Years' War, but with a war seemingly looming, um, British officials expel approximately 12,000 Acadians from the territory. Um, and this goes to that kind of basic concern between French uh, Catholics and English Protestants and that kind of cultural clash. Um, but also, of course, with war coming, this kind of fear that, that those people will form a, uh, an army within and will threaten in that kind of sense. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the details as that as, that as we go. But it certainly uh, ends, um, for, for most Acadians, their place in a territory that they had been inhabiting for over 100 years uh, and had been building and building farms and successful communities for over 100 years. So it's a traumatic and, and powerful and important story. We'll look at it in, uh, in four steps. Um, we'll look briefly at the, the myth of Evangeline, which is the way many people continue to understand the story of the Acadian expulsion. If you go today to the his National Historic site in Grand Pre, Nova Scotia. Um, the vision of the story you'll see there clings to the myth of Evangeline very, very closely. We'll, we'll talk about a bit more, more of that as we go. We'll talk about the imperial context of the story. I want you to see what's going on between Britain and France in the story and how the indigenous people are playing into the story and how the Acadia fits into that general kind of contest for control uh, in the area. We'll look at how Acadians achieved independence and identity in this time period. It's very much a a product both of that kind of um, geopolitical scenario around them, but also part of their ordinary livelihoods as farmers uh, in Acadia at the time. And then we'll finish by looking at the expulsion and its meaning uh, for Canadian history. So I want to begin with this with this uh, poem and the Evangeline myth. Um, the Evangeline myth stems from this poem written in the middle of the 19th century by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow one of the most popular poets in American history, uh, and, uh, and in fact, one of the most popular writers in the 19th century. Uh, this is a, we don't think of poems as, as big selling books, but this was a top seller. This was a bestseller in mid 19th century North America. Went through several editions, enormously popular and enormously influential. And it sets, maybe not the dominant image of Evangeline, but certainly the one in popular culture that prevails the strongest. If you go to the Grand Pre Historical, National Historic Site uh, in Grand Pre, Nova Scotia today, the story that they tell about the expulsion hues pretty closely to this line, closer to this line than, than certainly I'd rather them do, but you know, that's, I don't get to make these calls. Listen to this poem. This is, a, as I say, a 300 page poem. So this is a tiny little excerpt from it, but it captures something of the flavor of how he wants to, us, us to think about Acadians. So just listen for a second. Not, but tradition remains of the beautiful village of Grand Pre. We who believe in affection that hopes and endures and is patient, ye who believe in the beauty and strength of woman's devotion, list to the mournful tradition still sung by the pines of the forest, list to the tale of love and Acadie, home of the happy. The image there that I see is innocence and a kind of passivity of people who are, who are, who have history imposed upon them. 
Uh, they're a peasant people. They're a happy people. They have a carefree existence. Uh, lots of natural imagery there and women's devotion and so on. These are, are people who, as the story will show, are victimized by the British. And it's worth noting that this is an American writer, not a, not a British writer. Um, and so there's a, there's a certain anti-British sentiment uh, in this poem. So he wants to show this kind of barbaric thing uh, that the British did against this ha happy, simple peasant people. And that's really a, a prevailing image that will, that will endure in many people's imaginations for a long time afterwards, and as I say, in many ways still today. It shows up in other books, other novels. It shows up in movies. This is uh, the best known of these from 1929, but there's five or six movies made about this story. It's a compelling story. The story, I should, I should tell you what the story is. The story is a, is a basic story um, of a couple, Evangeline, the woman, uh, and Gabrielle, her love, who are separated in the expulsion, one sent on one ship and one sent on the other. And they spend the rest, and this is what the, the poem is about, they spend the rest of their lives searching for each other. So again, it's a, it's a way to personify the tragedy of this in this one couple and, and show the, 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 the enormous crime committed against these people by the British on these innocent peasant people. Um, and, and the poem certainly conveys that image and certainly these films and subsequent books uh, convey this image as well. So it's a good way to get that story together. And they, they do find each other in the end, but it's, you know, it's decades later uh, and she finds him and he's dying. So he, he dies in her arms. So it's that, you know, happy, sad, capital R, romantic uh, ending, which is, sounds really cheesy today, but it was um, certainly enormously popular and enormously influential uh, in, in the 19th century. And for some people still today. So here's Acadia. Let's talk a bit about what it is and why it matters. So it's the second colony, right? The, the other colony is Canada, modern day Quebec. Um, it has a tremendous imperial significance. It's not, uh, it's not a big colony, uh, but kind of in geopolitical terms, uh, it's really important. So let's look at that imperial context for a moment. Um, it's strategically very valuable. This arrow kind of points you to the waterway between Newfoundland and Nova Scotia which of course leads into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The Gulf of St. Lawrence leads into the St. Lawrence River. The St. Lawrence River leads to the Great Lakes. And that means that that waterway literally takes you to the heart of the continent. Um, so for access to the interior, and if you want to control the St. Lawrence River, um, you need to control that waterway as well. And so the British and the French view this as a strategically valuable location, but the French hold it, uh, and, but it's also why the British have eyes on it. It's also important because it juts out into the Atlantic. And so if you're sailing ships by Nova Scotia, by Newfoundland, to get to New England, to get to Boston, to get to New York, to get to Philadelphia, um, you need to go by Nova Scotia. Um, and so if the French control that, that means that French privateers uh, can have a heyday on British shipping. Um, so that's a problem. So again, there's this strategic positioning of the territory that makes it valuable. It's also adjacent to the, those fishing banks the, on the North Atlantic fishery. So those banks off the coast of New England, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, those are the best fishing banks in the world. Um, the, those are the sources of the most valuable fishery in the world at this time. Um, and so controlling access to that is very, very important. So in general, the French don't put a lot of resources into the colony, but they regard it as strategically valuable. So in the end, what you have is something which is small, poorly defended. There's never more than like 150 French soldiers um, in the colony, which is really quite remarkable. Um, but it's strategically and economically important. <clears throat> and those dimensions of the story will ultimately be very important to understanding the whole story. From 1604 until 1710, Acadia is a French colony. There's wars and things happening in the middle, but we can skip all that. Um, fundamentally, nothing changes in that century. However, a war breaks out in 1702 that's going to end in 1713, and another French-English uh, war, one of the many in this time period. But at the end of this, so sorry, in the midst of this, uh, New England forces capture uh, Port Royal, the capital of Acadia. This arrow points you to, to Port Royal. Um, 
and uh, in the subsequent peace negotiations, the mainland part of the Acadia, so, so not what's now Cape Breton, not what's now Prince Edward Island, but the mainland part of what's now Nova Scotia are passed to the British. And so you have this unusual, uh, it's the, the treaty noted here, it's the Treaty of Utrecht, 1713. So um, now you have the situation of French Catholics living in a territory run by British Protestants. Two people are continuously at war with tremendous cultural hostilities uh, between them. So, so that's, that's an interesting dynamic, interesting issue there. Um, so for the next 45 years, from 1710, when Port Royal is captured, until 1755, when the expulsion will take place, uh, Acadians and their British masters need to negotiate a relationship together. That in itself is a really interesting story. The British try to impose an oath of allegiance on the Acadians. The Acadians uh, accept that. I say the Acadians, it's, it's a leadership. It's a, it's a group of about 30 men from a couple of villages who come to, to meet with the British officers and the governor. Um, and they negotiate positions between the, the two parties. And the British demand an oath of allegiance. The Acadians come up with a solution, which is an interesting solution, and it makes perfect sense to them. They say, we'll take the oath of allegiance. We will promise allegiance to the, to the British king, British government. Uh, but there's that clause that says, um, bearing arms in support of the king. We won't agree to that clause. So we'll do the whole oath of allegiance except for that clause. Now it's a pretty important clause. It, you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of the ultimate clause. You know, we'll fight in support of our government. But the Acadians make this argument. Many of our people are intermarried with the Mi'kmaq. The Mi'kmaq are clearly, formally, officially aligned with, with, uh, with, uh, with the French. Um, so therefore we have family relationships with these people. Many of our people have family in Canada. So if the war were to involve invading Canada or something like that, you'd be asking us to fire on our own cousins and brothers and so on. In fact, that my own family fits into that bill. My family, uh, part of the Sansons end up in, in, in uh, Canada. Some of them end up in Acadia. So I could be potentially firing at, at cousins um, in, in a war. I could be firing at my Mi'kmaq brother-in-law or something like that. In other words, in these kinds of situations, you can't expect us to fight. Um, if you fight your wars, we won't fight on either side. We just want to farm. We just want to live our existence. This happens four times. And so just now I'll tell you about three of those. On all three occasions, the British grumble. They don't like the response, but they accept it. They, they, they accept the response. That'll change in 1755, but we'll come back to that 1755 moment in a while. But I want you to see that there's a kind of negotiation going on here. And again, go back to Longfellow. These people aren't just sitting passively by or waiting for the British to tell them what to do. They're negotiating. They're, 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 they're saying, we'll do some things, but we won't do other things. There's a, there's a power negotiation going on there. Uh, so that's not a passive response. They're, showing, they're certainly showing agency uh, in running their own lives. So that's, that's absolutely clear. The situation on the ground is messy in all kinds of ways. You've got New Englanders, British people, French Canadians from Canada, some missionaries and so on. So a couple of military people get on the ground, not many, but some. Uh, and you've got the Mi'kmaq. And the Mi'kmaq are certainly trying to find their own place in all of this. The other messy element, though, is that the British and the French don't even agree on who controls what territory. After the treaty is signed, we don't need to worry too much about this here today, but there is an ambiguity in, in the description of exactly what the French are giving up. And of course, the French try to play that ambiguity to their advantage, and the English try to play that ambiguity to their advantage. And the British view, and admittedly, the British view is the one that makes the most kind of obvious sense. But if you read the clause, you'd see why the French were saying something different. But the British view, this is the one on the right here, shows that all that territory marked in red, 
is passed to the British. That was all French territory. It's all passed to the British. All that's left to the French is the north side of the St. Lawrence River. So modern day Quebec and Montreal and so on. Prince Edward Island, Cape Breton, and the other islands in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The French, on the other hand, say, no, what it talks about are the coasts of Acadia, uh, the Atlantic coasts of Acadia. So they interpret it in the left-hand version as just that red line along the southern coast of what's modern-day Nova Scotia. And they say the rest of it's still all French. The British and the French will spend 40 years um, in diplomatic negotiations. They'll never resolve this. At, on the, on, when the Seven Years' War, War breaks out in the 1750s, uh, this is still unresolved. Uh, in fact, it is not a huge irritant between them, but it's a significant one. It's one that they do spend a fair bit of, I mean, given that it's a small colony in, in, on the other side of the ocean, it, it's surprising how much attention they do pay to it. There's several negotiations over the, several uh, delegations uh, put together over those decades to negotiate all of this. Never uh, actually settle. But what I want you to see, though, is that the territory itself is disputed over who owns it. And it means that on the ground, people's senses of who's in control aren't always clear. And as you see in your readings for this week, that'll be important. Canadians do very well in this time period. Ironically, they do better under the British than they did under the French. Not because the British system was better or anything, but just because it meant an end to the wars. Uh, it meant that they could suddenly just trade freely with New England. They had trade, traded with New England in the past, but it was largely smuggling going on. Now it's open trade. So suddenly they have some, some stability in place, and I want to suggest that they thrive for a series of reasons, and that economic success is part of that. The other things, though, we can point to are weak state institutions. The French had very limited state presences in Acadia. The British have even weaker state presences in Acadia. They put up a couple hundred troops in the capital, Port Royal. Every once in a while, some of those troops will march up and down the valley, but not very often. Um, there's no taxation, there's no direct government. The Acadians are more or less left to govern themselves, largely. They, they're certainly called to the capital, the leadership are called to the capital every once in a while. Uh, they have the right to petition uh, for changes and things like that, money to build a bridge, those kinds of things. Um, but largely, there's a kind of autonomy granted to the Acadian villages. They do very well. Um, the, the, the land they're on, Nova Scotia doesn't have a lot of great farmland, but this is the best in Nova Scotia. They're on it. It's all these river valleys that they're diking, they're creating these uh, massive diked farmlands. Really some of the best agricultural land in eastern North America, much better than you would find, for example, in Maine or Massachusetts, two places which are kind of notorious for, for bad soil, bad, bad growing conditions. They're, they're on rich agricultural sites here. And now that they have access to the New England market and don't have to worry about a ship attacking them in the process, their, their agriculture thrives and their trade thrives. Uh, so they're doing very, very well here. They're also officially neutral. And again, that goes to those negotiations we were talking about. Now, as you'll see in your readings, not everybody believes this neutrality. And in some ways, they have reason not to believe this neutrality. And they certainly have ongoing relationships with the Mi'kmaq and so on. But broadly speaking, they maintain a distance from the troubled imperial context around them. Part of that includes the relationships with the Mi'kmaq. And as I said, they often have familial relationships with, with Mi'kmaq people. Oftentimes, Acadians will marry uh, Mi'kmaq people. So you have French Mi'kmaq families formed. Um, and so generally, you have strong relationships between the Mi'kmaq and the French settlers. And so many of the Mi'kmaq convert to Catholicism, so there's another cultural connection there. And so there, there's pretty strong relationships there. And that will also add to the stability uh, of the situation. The last thing I want to point to is community. And community is kind of a nebulous term, but I think in the case of the Acadians, you can see a real um, concrete basis for community. And it's very, very powerful, and it's very effective for them in this time period. And I'll show you what this is all about. This is a bit technical, and so forgive me for that, but um, it's kind of necessary to explain this. The Bay of Fundy has enormous tides, the highest tides in the world on the Bay of Fundy. It means that all the sh along the shore, the water will twice daily rise um, as much as 20 meters, but in most of the locations we're looking at um, 8 to 12 meters. That's meters. That's a lot of water. 
uh, and that will flood down rivers along the shore and so on. So you have tidal rivers, for example, that are kind of dry at one part of the day and flowing another part of the day. What that means is there's continually salt water coming into the system. That's bad. You don't want salt water on agricultural lands. But if you dike it, if you build large dikes around those, around those rivers, holding back the seawater and allowing the salt water to drain off, what you're left with are really rich agricultural sites. In fact, as I say, some of the, some of the best in eastern North America. So in this map you can see here from 1753, these green arrows are pointing to some gray shaded areas. Those are marshlands. And what the Acadians do is build dikes on those marshlands to hold back the sea and they farm behind them. And they have really a very successful agriculture. These dikes are enormous. I can't stress how big these things are. We're talking things that are several hundred meters long. Uh, and uh, as this illustration shows, as much as 12, 14, 15 meters high. Now this is one particular dike, which is 11.6 meters high. This is in near Wolfville, Nova Scotia. In fact, uh, tonight on the forum video that you'll see, you'll see me standing on one of these dikes uh, outside of Wolfville, Nova Scotia in, in the 21st century. Um, but what I want you to see is how big they are and how they got constructed. So they're, they're enormous, they're earthenware, earthenware, they're earthen. Um, they used logs and trees and so on to kind of build up the bulk of them. Um, but they're built by hand. They have oxen, they have cows, they have some horses uh, to build these math massive earthworks with. They don't have bulldozers, they don't have heavy equipment to work with. They're doing it by hand. And they're holding back, not rivers, the ocean. I mean, there's few things on the planet more powerful to be held back. They're holding it back. This illustration also shows you that the, the four and a half meters of topsoil available, that's fantastic. I mean, here in Niagara, there's nothing like that in terms of, in terms of quality of good topsoil. And you can see that little stick figure human there giving you a sense of, of, uh, of, a, of a human relationship to all of that. This is an aerial photograph of a dike today. It's on a river. You can see the river is very brown. That's all the silt that the, from, the, from the tides that the, that the river is picking up. But I want you to see all those lines, not, not, the, not, the, not the striated lines, not the closely parallel lines there, but the kind of boundary lines that look like fields. Those are individual dikes. And then there's a bigger dike around the outside containing all that in. And that's how these dikes are built, one segment at a time. And the amount of labor that goes into these things is enormous. This particular dike was built over 100 years, over a 100 year time period because individual people can't just build their own dikes. This is not Farmer Bob's dike and Farmer Betty's dike. Um, these are dikes built by the entire community because that's the only way you can build these things. You need to get masses of people together, entire villages, to build sections of dike. And then the next year they'll build another section of dike. And then the next year they'll build another section of dike and so on. And what this means is that Acadians see the roots of their own success in their own collective endeavor. Now think about this. If you're a farmer in Guelph or here in Niagara or you know, wherever, you're an individual farmer, you cut down your trees, you build your fields, your family works together. You'll have families working together on special projects. You've probably seen things like, you know, kind of barn raisings and things like that where you know, communities get together for an afternoon to help each other out and that sort of thing. And that certainly fosters a kind of community spirit, no doubt about it. But for these people, everything they do is rooted in that collective community experience. So their success in agriculture, their success in trade, their success therefore in maintaining their independence on the land, everything stems from the construction and maintenance of these dikes. It's a, an amazing, amazing story. And that's what they build together. They build it as not just as individuals, not just as families, but as communities coming up with this immense success. So here, and what we're looking at tonight in our readings is uh, a context for what we'll be looking at. So we've seen the imperial context of Britain and France struggling to control this territory. 
and we've seen an on the ground context where communities are forming, how they're forming, and that they're interacting with these larger colonial forces. Two other quick bits of context to emphasize uh, other details that we should keep in mind when we think about our readings tonight. In this time period, as I said, people know a war is coming. They don't know it's the Seven Years' War. They don't know that that war will be one of the biggest wars the planet will ever see. Um, but they know a war is coming. They know Britain and France uh, are, are in ongoing tensions. They're not being resolved. Things are happening on the continent in Europe. Things are happening in North America. Not being resolved. A war is coming. So in the colonies, they're fortifying for war. And I just want to point quickly to these two locations. The B on the modern day border between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia is Beau Sejour, Fort Beau Sejour. A beautiful day. Uh, and at Louisbourg uh, in modern day Cape Breton, the L. And that's a major fortress there, a much larger one than, than the one at Beau Sejour. But it's the French preparing for this. And in this kind of contested territory, um, this is uh, an attempt to show strength on the ground. And so these will be part of the elements and the stories that you'll be reading about in our forum readings this week. The other thing is, and this is where Indigenous people come fully into the story. Even while Britain and France are not at war, there's an ongoing series of wars all along the frontier between Acadia and New England and Canada and New England and New York. Um, and Indigenous people are in that territory. And they're in the other territories as well, but this is still their territory. Most of those Indigenous people are aligned with the French most of those people are in line with the French because the French are putting less pressure on them than the British are. And the British are putting pressure on them both militarily and through expanded and quite aggressive settlement. If any of you have done any American colonial history, you may know about the King Philip's War, a huge war that takes place in the 1670s in northern New England. It's the bloodiest of all the colonial wars in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, it sees massive deaths on both sides. That war spread north, uh, and even after the war formally ended, continued well into the 18th century and had um, episodic um, outbursts again throughout the 18th century. And what you're seeing generally is ongoing kind of frontier warfare where indigenous people are pushing back uh, against the, the, uh, the, the, the incursions of British settlers in northern New England. This is not directly part of the Acadian story, but it's indirectly part of the Acadian story in the sense that from a New England perspective, this is all the same story. This is those French Catholic Indians to the north and they are attacking our people. That's how they see this. Of course, the Acadians don't see it that way and of course the Wabanaki don't see it. So who, oh, sorry, right. So who are the Wabanaki? Wabanaki is a confederacy. Six nations are a confederacy. Uh, this too is a confederacy and it's where uh, a group of previously, not hostile, but, but not aligned indigenous people come together to fight uh, against the British and to better control their territory. Uh, there's about six groups involved here, but the most important ones are the Mi'kmaq from modern day Nova Scotia, the Maliseet from modern day Western New Brunswick, uh, and the Abenaki who are in Maine, Vermont, and up into Southern Quebec. Um, those three groups form the Wabanaki Confederacy and over the course of the 18th century will continue to exert significant military influence um, in that region and it will all be in the service of protecting their hold on that territory. Um, and from a French perspective, this is really, really good, of course, because it means that there's a kind of buffer war that they don't have to fight. It's a war that other people are kind of fighting for them. The Wabanaki are not fighting for them. Do not think there's this kind of older mythological view that you know Indians fought to help the French allies and so on. And to some extent, occasionally they, they probably did, but in general, they're fighting to preserve their own territory. They're fighting to preserve their own place on their own land. Uh, and that's clearly what's going on here. So that will be part of the story that you'll be seeing uh, in your readings this week as well. So war approaches. What are you going to do with the Acadians? Now, context. French settlers, French Catholic settlers in what's now a British territory. How to deal with those people? We've already seen part of the answer to that question uh, in the Oaths of Allegiance, that, uh, that one way to deal with these people was to require of them to, to voice 
support for the British. And we saw the, the exception uh, that played there. Before I go on to tell the story, though, I want to just do a little quick sidebar here and say, we're going to see this again next week, except it won't be about Acadians, it'll be about Canadians. Because in the Seven Years' War, Canada will be captured as well, the, the larger French colony, and they'll have to ask the same question about the, about the, Acad about the Canadians. Uh, and so it's just worthwhile noting today uh, that we're going to get one answer. Next week we're going to get a different answer, so we'll see. Anyhow, moving along, what to do about the Acadians? So as the war approaches, um, a series of battles break out along the frontier. Uh, and it encourages uh, another battle to be fought in what's modern day New Brunswick. When the British troops, the British troops win this particular small battle, um, and when they get inside the stockade, they find about a dozen Acadian men. This, of course, flies in the face of, of the oath they are taking. They're saying we're neutral. They're saying we're, we're not going to fight on either side should the war come out. Now, it's only a dozen men you know, in a population of about 12, as much as 15,000 people. We don't really have a good number for these people. Um, but, you know, so we're talking a tiny, tiny slice of the population, but it sends a bad signal. There's, there's no doubt about that. And in response to this, the British leadership in Halifax call the Acadian leadership um, into Halifax and they say, take the oath of allegiance or we will expel your people from the colony. Now the Acadian leadership has heard this before. We, we talked about this earlier. They go back to their people, they, they talk to them, and they come back to Halifax and they get the exact same answer. They're calling the British bluff here. They say the exact same thing. We will take this oath of allegiance, but it's going to be qualified. We will not include the clause about bearing arms in defense of the king. And there's no negotiations. This time, they say, we're going to expel you. Now, interesting little side note here. The British officials in Halifax don't actually have the power to make this decision. They send a message back to London requesting permission or advice on what to do. And the reply comes back, do nothing. Um, send troops out to try to contain them if you think you need to, but don't engage in this expulsion idea that you're that you're talking about. They're urged not to do it. They're urged not to do it for two reasons. One, on humanitarian grounds, they don't use that term, but they say it would be just a cruel thing to do to these people. And two, that it would just be plainly expensive and not probably not especially effective. Uh, and what they also see is that so far the Acadians have actually been adhering, and so far too, they're producing a lot of food, which if a war breaks out would be valuable. So they think it makes more sense not to expel the Acadians. Except it takes weeks for that decision to go out and to come back. And in the meantime, the British leadership in Halifax decides to just go ahead with it. So they begin expelling the Acadians. The expulsion takes place in June, between June and September of 1755. There'll be other iterations of this in subsequent years as they try to hunt down more people, as they capture uh, Ile Royale, as they capture Ile Saint-Jean, as they capture more territory, they'll, they'll expel more people. But the, the big one takes place in 1755, the more famous of them, and they expel between eight and 12,000 people uh, in that year. Approximately 3,000 of these people will die, highlighting even further the barbarity of the practice. Um, most of those people will die of disease, um, caught on board ships or in prisons uh, where they're held in miserable conditions, um, or in shipwrecks off the coast, several ships um, wreck along the way as they're taking them to they take them to different places they take them to new england they take them to new york they take them to virginia they take them to the caribbean they take them to louisiana louisiana ones of course will become a famous population and of themselves uh, they'll come to be known as cajuns which of course is a bastardization of acadia and um, that will become a, a predominant a prominent part of of french culture in louisiana which still exists today some of them will be sent back to France, some of them will be sent back to England. Um, it will be a horrible experience for all of them. The British burn all their farms, burn all their uh, barns, their houses, everything. All the, all, the, all the human and economic capital that's been built up over three, four generations gets destroyed that summer, uh, which is quite a remarkable thing. 
They gather them in kind of collection points along the shore. They bring several vessels in. They put them in small boats. They take them out to the larger boys, boats and distribute them around the Atlantic world. It's a remarkable story. It really, truly is a remarkable story. We should highlight that there is significant resistance, not huge numbers. The Acadians don't have very many weapons. Um, but those that do try to engage in some kind of resistance. And this is significant too to the, to the Longfellow story. So not only do we see negotiations and diplomatic negotiations uh, with the British in terms of the Oath of Allegiance, which is certainly showing agency, uh, many of them actively militarily resisted uh, as well. Most famous of these people is this guy, Joseph Broussard, uh, who has a nom de guerre, uh, Beau Soleil, uh, that's how he's known at the time. And if you listen to Acadian music, there's lots of songs about Beau Soleil. And he's a, a, an Acadian, Cajun, uh, uh, heroic figure uh, standing up, resisting uh, the British in this, in this dire moment uh, of his people's history. So an interesting story there. But you can see this list also points to some military people, uh, some priests, uh, and most importantly, Mi'kmaq support. Uh, certainly, uh, the Mi'kmaq had an historic uh, poor relationship with the British. They're formally aligned almost entirely with the, with the French. Uh, and they certainly uh, actively uh, aid the Acadian resistance. But of course, they're resisting themselves. They're resisting for their, for their own purposes as well. Um, and in this case, it's as much the Acadians helping uh, a Mi'kmaq resistance as it is Mi'kmaq uh, supporting an Acadian resistance. But certainly there's, there's still a resistance there. And that's important. It means that uh, for some time to follow, uh, the British will continue to have to kind of tend to these kind of small battles around the region. It's not the Seven Years' War. It's not the kind of big famous battles of the Seven Years' War. But it means that the British don't have a secure hold on this territory. Already the British are wanting to bring settlers into this territory. They can't bring settlers into this territory um, if there's still an, a resistance moving, movement going on in the ground. So again, it, it limits the, the, the British capacity to act in the way that they wish to act. So this is Acadia in 1754, just before the expulsions take place. It's largely the, 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 what's here described as the Acadian Peninsula. Um, it's mainland Nova Scotia today. All their settlements are along the Bay of Fundy, uh, that, that wa waterway between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Uh, not all of them. You can see there's a couple actually on the on the Northumberland side, but not very many. Uh, really quite quite small settlements elsewhere. And there's a couple in PEI and a couple in Cape Breton. Um, that changes in 1755. So not only do those peop many people are expelled, uh, but uh, they lose all their lands as well. And, and English and New England settlers will begin moving into that territory. We'll talk about that particular point uh, next week as well. Um, some people do survive the expulsion, uh, both staying in Nova Scotia, uh, avoiding being expelled, uh, and some return after the Seven Years' War. But those people don't return to those settlements, those uh, traditional lands. They return to different locations. So here's a map of of, uh, of Acadia in 1754, and most of the Acadians are around the Bay of Fundy. Here's a map of Acadia today, and it's those yellow areas. And a couple of them correspond, in, on the Nova Scotia part, a couple of them correspond to, uh, to uh, the older areas, but not much. Most of it's now in northern New Brunswick, and that really represents the people having been displaced from their traditional lands, and then returning and taking up lands uh, that were allowed to be available to French people. And those are generally inferior lands, um, not particularly good agricultural lands. And that's why today um, the Acadian population is more associated with the fishery uh, than it is with agriculture. Certainly in the 18th century that was not true. They, some of them fished for sure, um, but most of them were farmers. And now it's the other way around. Some of them farm, but most of them fish. Well, today most of them you know, work in malls or whatever. but. But in terms of kind of the basis for the economy around the area, um, certainly fishing is far more important uh, than agriculture. So that re meant uh, an enormous shift, not just in terms of the lands that they were on and their history and identity and association with particular places, but also the ways that they made, that they made their livelihood and being forced to exist in, in uh, not especially good locations. So what can we take from this? Well, the big thing I want you to take from this is how this small story 
fits in that big story. Uh, now we haven't actually got to the Seven Years' War yet. We're going to do that next week. Um, but you can see that there's this large imperial context, this struggle between the British and the French, and on the ground there are these people trying to cope with this. Uh, and I would suggest to you that this is a common imperial story, co common colonial story, in this case between the British and the French, but we find it all over. Um, I know I've talked to, uh, uh, to other historians who study other displaced peoples uh, during wartime, and the stories are very, very similar. So looking at displaced peoples, for example, after the Second World War in Europe, very similar stories, people being pushed out of one territory and into another territory, people being mass murdered in the process. Um, this story is of a kind with those stories. It's very much um, a story of imperial, uh, imperial um, struggles uh, and how people are affected by that, how people on the ground are affected by that. The Mi'kmaq lose in this story as well because they lose um, a, a kind of strong connection to an existing economy here. Um, they're displaced not only from family members, cultural ties, and a weakened military place in their land, but they're also dislocated from the relatively strong economy that the Acadians had. So certainly their participation in aspects of agricultural, hist agricultural uh, the agricultural economy rather, uh, and the fur trade uh, and the fisheries um, was weakened in this process as well. So economically, uh, the Mi'kmaq come out on the, on the short end of this as well. And that will be e even further amplified at the end of the Seven Years' War when they will find themselves having effectively back to the wrong horse uh, in a war. I say in a war, you know, 100, 150 years of, 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 of alliance there, of, of parallel working together. But this will change their place in that broader geopolitical climate really quite enormously. Uh, it won't be until another 30, 40 years after the American Revolution that you'll see a significant demographic shift into Nova Scotia when the Loyalists arrive, and we'll pick up that story next week. Um, so they will not be displaced wholly from the land in this time period, but they're certainly weakened. They find themselves in a far weaker context than they had been before. So both the French Acadian settlers um, find tragedy and dislocation in the story, and both the Mi'kmaq and the Mi'kmaq uh, find tragedy and dislocation in this story. And both will come out of this story uh, enormously weakened. But it's important to go back to Longfall. It's important to see that they were not passive in the story, that they actively resisted. They tried to carve the best course that they could in a really difficult situation. And that's critical for us to understand in the story. Enjoy your readings. We'll see you in the forum and we'll be talking about all of that there. Take care.